Hola, hola, ¿cómo les va? Soy Milena Jimón y esto es Fuera de Lugar. Y el día de hoy vamos a estar haciendo algo poco habitual, que es hablar en inglés con nuestro protagonista. Justamente Dudley Stokes es el entrevistado. El día de hoy vamos a estar hablando de lo que fue él como inspiración para la realización de una película llamada Jamaica Bajo Cero. Seguramente muchos de ustedes la vieron, muchos de ustedes lloraron, Muchos de ustedes disfrutaron esta gran película protagonizada por John Candy en, en su oportunidad y donde evidentemente se cuenta la historia de un grupo de Jamaica que va a representar a su país en los Juegos Olímpicos de invierno, sí, de invierno en Calgary 1988. Vamos a hablar entonces con el, el inspirador de esta historia y veremos cuánto hay de real justamente en la película Grabada en los 90. Here we are. We have Carl Stokes. Uh, this is the the story behind the, the the movie I loved in the 90s. And actually, I want to say thank you for your time. And it's a really inspiring story. So I wanted to know how truth uh, is a, uh, the film about. Well, the, the film was not a documentary. So, you know, it was not a literary representation. It was meant to, to be entertaining and, and to be funny, and it was those things. Um, and it's proven to be very popular over the years. What it, it did do is it, it captured this, the spirit of Jamaica Bobsley, of what we tried to do in 88 and what we continued trying down through the, the years. I... I'm a four-time Olympian, so I went to the 92 games, 94 games, and the 98 games after the events that that inspired Cool Runnings from 1988. So the the movie captured the spirit, and it it gave us reason to continue through encouragement, but also through promoting us. The wonderful thing about this movie. Of course, every time you do a movie uh, for, I mean, which is not a documentary, like you said, uh, it has a lot of fantasy. But the, 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 tr the story about it, that Jamaica, which is a Caribbean uh, island, uh, got to bobsleigh and also to the Olympic Games, that's the, the wonderful about the story. Uh, everything else is beautiful. And we talk about uh, the last scene, which I loved, uh, but I mean, uh, just the fact that Jamaica got to the uh, Winter Olympic Games, it's wonderful. How, how did that happen? Um, with a lot of bumps along the way. But, but you're, you're right. The, 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 the strangeness, you know, truth is stranger than fiction, but the, the whole strangeness of a, of a bobstay team from Jamaica um, was a, a big boost. And in fact, the two Americans actually founded the Jamaica Bobstay team while living in Jamaica, um, William Maloney and George Fitch. And George Fitch always had in his mind from the very beginning that he could turn this into a movie. And so that's one of the things he set out to do and was in fact very successful at it. But, you know, it started in a bar. They were both uh, drinking rum and cokes and watching on the television in the bar, they the Pushcart Derby, which you see depicted in the film as well. And they saw that and they said, hey, you know, that, that looks a lot like bobsledding. So William Maloney wanted to walk in the opening ceremonies of an Olympic Games and George Fish wanted to do a movie. And now they saw the Pushcart Derby and it looked like, like a bobsleigh. And, and, you know, so with a few drinks, they, they came up with the idea <laughs> and then they went about doing it. They could not get athletes to take them seriously and to, to try the sport for some obvious reasons. So they went to the military and they, they, they spoke to the head of, our, our, of the athletics in the military and told him they needed some, some soldiers to try the sport. And I was serving at the time. I was in the army, the Jamaican army. I, I flew helicopters and they said, and I also played football for the, the army team. So they said to the The, the colonel in charge that we need somebody with proven hand-eye coordination to try to teach to drive this bobsled. Now, you know, if you imagine, this is in August of, of 1987 and the Olympics are in February of 1988. 
so it, it was like a long shot but the, the colonel said yes i have the guy for you and he called down to my unit and i basically was told to go you know they, they i was fairly athletic and i was a helicopter pilot so i figured that i could learn to drive a bobsleigh in the five months remaining to the olympics which do you think that that training uh, of military helped to be ready in five months only uh, to the olympics oh yeah for sure for sure so you know i i, I had extensive training I joined as an 18 year old and by the time i was 20 i had been through the training in jamaica then i went overseas to the royal military academy sandhurst which is the the renowned british institute. and then i learned to fly in in canada in 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 on the prairie province called uh, manitoba and spent and that's some of the most brutal weather you'll ever come across. So I spent a year there learning to fly. And then I spent a further six months in the United States, in, in Fort Rock, Alabama, um, on advanced flying training. So by the time I came to Bob State, I, I you know, was, was very experienced in the, the systems and the methodologies. Um, I'd flown several thousand hours doing all sorts of, of, of roles. And um, so I was just very experienced in in operating under pressure. And the other team members, uh, did they also get from the army? Uh, I know your brother was on the team also, right? Yes, my brother was on the team, but he joined in the second week of the Olympics. He came to the Olympics to, to watch. And he's, he's a genuine world-class athlete. He was a 100-meter sprinter. And if you remember from the movie, his his story inspired that scene where where they've just failed to make it in the Olympic trials because he, he actually um, missed out on the, the 1984 Summer Games by a place, one one place in a photo finish. And the dangers, uh, which uh, means to, to be in a bobsleigh, because it's really dangerous. Now, how, how dangerous uh, for the people who, who haven't uh, never ride a bobsleigh? How dangerous it is? It, it is a, a dangerous sport in, inherently, meaning that you know you, you you're going down a hill at at eighty miles an hour with in 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 something made of of carbon fiber and uh, it it you can't hurt yourself. There are no and over the years, lots and lots and lots of protocols and safety features and so on to make it safer. But, you know, it's, it's a, a sport that has a lot of speed and power and, and corners, and it requires uh, a certain ability and uh, to think and act to, to stay safe. You know, it was, it was really pushing the boundaries. And, and the, the, you know, the fact that we crashed, I'm sure, came as no surprise to the other athletes around. But it was... It was a crazy thing to try. You need a lot more experience <laughs> and yeah. you need a lot more practice than we had at that stage. What it really helped with was that that was a methodology to learn to drive the sled. Uh, and just based on how, you know, I was taught to fly in fixed wing aircraft, I was taught to fly in, in helicopters and the different stages that you go through and the things that you try. So I was able to set up my a personal program to learn to drive the bobsleigh that was inspired from that. The, the actual um, transfer of the skills of, of piloting an aircraft to driving a bobsleigh, I'm not sure that, that there was a great deal of transference there. A bobsleigh is a, is a much more difficult thing to handle and it requires a lot more input than merely hand-eye coordination. Um, you know, you're, you're in, a, in a vehicle that's completely under the influence of gravity. Gravity is accelerating to great speeds, gravity on, on corners and taking it down. And a way to work with gravity because you, you can't work against it. And if you work against it, you're going to crash. You have to find a way to work with it. Different in some respects from, from aircraft, even aerobatic aircraft and so on don't 
don't actually have it, it's, it's not the same feel and it's not really a transferable skill how, how did that happen uh he got the the, the ioc well the ioc became interested because you know they they have a mission to expand um the participation and the number of sports and so and especially it's especially difficult in the winter games because you have certain very constraining things in the, for you know for many nations so they became keen so then they they at the time was called the FIBT which is now the IBSF they became interested mostly because they were bordering on the minimum number of nations. So if you have a sport and it's an Olympic sport, you have to have participation from a certain minimum number of nations. It differs between sports and between winter and summer. But they were not having enough nations to remain legal within the, the Olympic uh, movement. And so they saw bringing Jamaica on as an opportunity. To, to keep the numbers up. Uh, of course, since then, they've had a flood of, of non-traditional nations, including our you know, your own country is, yeah. is, is you now involved in the sliding sports. Uh, so the, 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 the FIBT wanted us to participate because it made the numbers look better to the Olympics. The month of pre-Olympic training in January, which we did in Lake Placid, New York, a very difficult track. Uh, and while we're training, the second driver, um, he quit the program. He decided that he wasn't going to go through with it. So he left. So we were left with, with uh, three other athletes. And, and you know, well, there were, there were four of us there with the alternate athletes. But there would only be two people in the Olympics with one two-man sled. And so the, 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 the guys started talking among themselves and they came to me and they said, we need to have a way where we all can compete. And we think that is through doing four-man, you know, where you drive the four-man sled. So I said, oh, well, I mean, I would, I would try it, but let's find out from George Fitch if it's possible. So we got on a conference call with George. We told him the story and he said, all right. I'm going to get a four-man four sled for you in Lake Placid. And if you can drive it there successfully, then I'll start working on the, the, um, the FIBT to get into the four-man race in the Olympics. And so we started halfway up the track uh, one, one afternoon. And we were just the only sled out there. And the weather was terrible. It was, it was like negative 20. And then it got a little warmer, but it started snowing. And we did in a row and they, the, the guys were destroyed they were crying in the back of the sled and carried on <laughs> and I said do you want to do four man <laughs> we don't have a lot of time go and so and that's how it started and um and we, we went to Calgary without a four man sled and so it is the movie one of the more accurate parts of the movie is that they, the Canadians actually had a sled they had forgotten about and in our warehouse and hey, and George talked his way into the sled and they said, okay, we lend that to you. And we went down and it was not in the best condition. But, you know, we, we went. Wow, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing story, right? Uh, so John Candy's character would be like the, the match of these two guys? Uh, or, or did he really um, exist? Well, th there, was, there was a third character who came on board who just... George, George Fitcher, William Maloney found, uh, who was an actual bobsledder and uh, who raced for the, the US team in, um, in 1980 and 83. He competed and he was disqualified in one of those events, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't for cheating stuff. He was disqualified for, for missing one of the, one of the parameters, either in weight or some dimension. Uh, so that kind of inspired the John Candy story. But there was a gentleman named Howard Siler, who was an insurance executive, but, but had for many, many years been a bobsled. And he was our first coach. And, you know, he first put us on the ice. And, um, and, and you know, he looked a bit like John Candy, too, at least in size by that time. But um, so, so... 
both characters in Cool Runnings are amalgamations of of um, several people and and stories. And, and the last scene, because I, I love that, and I think it's uh, where everybody cries. Uh, was that really true? Uh, I mean, did you felt and everybody and, and you walked to the line? Ah, uh, no. Because a, a bobsleigh weighs like 600 kilos, so you know there was no way we were going to get that on our shoulders. So <laughs> that didn't happen. But that was part of the the, the spirit at that I spoke about of you know what what cool runs because it 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 really touched people that that whole construction it it touched people and it, it dramatized. What we actually did, which was to walk away with our heads held high and determined to come back um, again. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's a, it's a very human moment. And, it, you know, it, it, if, you, if you can have a movie that makes you laugh and makes you cry, then I think you'll be on your way <laughs> to, yeah. to having something that lasts. Yeah. So you came back uh, to Jamaica as heroes. You know, after 88 and we crashed and we had all those the, the, those issues, I thought that we, we we were going to be really badly treated when we got back to Jamaica. Because, you know, it, it is a, it's a proud sporting tradition, um, proud Olympic tradition. And um, I thought we had let, it, let, let everybody down. And we, we got back home and people were were impressed something met what people were really impressed with is that we actually went out onto ice <laughs> went sliding down a hill <laughs> people were saying no this and they said you yeah, only Jamaica would look to do this and um and so I, I felt better but it, it also kept us going for a few more years it was inspiring and then after 94 it, 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 that was you know that was a huge party you know, we're ahead of all America Yeah. And then, you know, the, the, the lots of Jamaicans in, in the diaspora scattered around the world. And, um, you know, moments like that is very important to them because a lot of them are living in, in difficult conditions, uh, climate, you know, work situation, so on. And they, they deserve some moments where they, they can laugh and smile and they can go into work. So it's been yeah. a pleasure to talk to you. You are really an inspiring person and actually it's one of my favorite stories of all times. I've seen a lot of, of sports movie because I'm a sport fan and uh, like Moneyball, yeah. uh, like, I mean, I don't know, Field of Dreams is not a true story, but uh, I mean, true stories, this is my favorite of all time. So it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Melina. I, I appreciate you reaching out and I enjoyed talking to you and I wish you all the best. Ok, thank you very much. Recuerden seguirnos en todas las plataformas para que les lleguen las notificaciones de nuevos episodios. Nos buscan colocando fuera de lugar con Milena.